an. Hel Hello. Just smile in case my mother's watching. Good to see you this morning. I trust you're all well. It's good that things are becoming back to, I was going to say normal, but I don't think anybody knows what the new normal is. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're here, it's good to see you all. I bring you greetings from our own fellowship at uh, Ladywell in Livingston. And we trust in these days that lie ahead, you as a fellowship might know God's peace and presence and all that you're involved in and all that you seek to do for him. May you continue to grow as a fellowship. May you continue to water and plant and may the good God give the growth. The last time we were here, we were speaking on Pentecost. It was Pentecost Sunday and it was good to share. And I said when I come back the following week, we would look at the whole word comforter about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit oh you could spend hours and hours and hours and months looking at just that one person so I just want to look at a couple of things about the Comforter and then I'm just going to finish up with two or three stories from God's Word about the importance of prayer and how it is the Comforter that guides us into what we pray for okay yes chap good (laughs) let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your goodness to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for all that we have and all that we are that is in him. And although we're thankful that you're a God who is around us, you're a God who's beneath us, you're a God that's beside us, above all these things, Lord, we give you thanks that you're a God who is above us. You're God Almighty. You're you're not a pal. We do have a friend in Jesus, but you're God Almighty. And we gather in his name this morning that we might hear of and from your word. So open it to our hearts, we pray, for we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and we'll pick up from verse 15. Most of you will be very familiar with the beginning of John chapter 14, where Jesus comforts his disciples. As he tells to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Well, believe in me. And we know that. We've said that before. Who else can we go to? Where else can we turn? Apart from God Almighty. And so he spoke to the disciples. He speaks about Jesus, the way to the Father. And then he promises us the Holy Spirit. So we pick up from verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All of us, I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will 
not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming he has no hold on me but the world must learn that I love the father and that I do exactly what my father has commanded me Amen and may God add his richest blessing to this the public reading of his word. May he give us understanding too as we come and look at this this morning. So we'll get hopefully we're up and running. That's good Michael's out preaching. We, we pray that God might indeed bless him as he ministers. I'm sure God will minister all his word today as it's brought forth throughout the whole world. Can I is that me on? Can you press the first one? Oh, bring back Michael. Hey, yo. <laughs> Sorry, I just joke about. We said this the last time we were here. All, all of us love gifts. I love Christmas. Less than six months to go. Oh, brilliant. I love my birthday. I love getting presents. I love getting gifts. I think it's totally amazing. And we know that God's gift to us is grace. It's God's gift to us is eternal life. But it's only available because God's greatest gift to the world is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't deny that. Out of all the things you have, that is the bestest. That's not a word, is it? That is the bestest gift you and I can ever have. And top of all that, the Lord Jesus Christ's gift to his church is the Holy Spirit. It's just totally amazing. Now we know that Jesus, when he was going to be with his father, wouldn't leave us, as God's word tells us, as orphans. He wasn't going to leave us on our own. He didn't say, I'm going to save you, and by the way, when the time is right, I'll just come and take you back again. He, he leaves us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to be with us. To poke us and to encourage us, to rebuke us, all these things. And we know these things. So the Lord Jesus' great gift to his church is the Holy Spirit. And we know that when Jesus came to this earth to lay aside his majesty and his glory, he did not exercise any of his divine rights. And yet from his birth, the Holy Spirit we know was with him. And when Jesus commenced his ministry, following his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and remained in him. And we know these things. And after his resurrection, Jesus says to his disciples, As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Receive. The Holy Spirit. So I want to look at that with you very, very briefly. Uh, I'll say it briefly, but that's, that, that will not be true. <laughs> My text this morning is from John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. I believe in Harry Potter. Correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there are over 250 references in the New Testament to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, the Comforter or the Counselor. 250. The Holy Spirit deserves his rightful place in our lives. He is a person, he is equal with the Father and the Son. And in verse 16, we read that Jesus called him another comforter. After all, was Jesus not a comforter? He comforted his people. And the number of times he comforted people who are in need, the number of times he comforted his disciples, the number of times he kind of told them to get their act together, but when he left, he gives us another comforter. They're never left on their own. Totally amazing. When I was young, even when I'm old, I, I'm not a particular fan of the dark. Let me tell you. And see, when I was growing up and I was in a dark room and the lights are all off, thank goodness my brother was next to me. Just to know somebody's there. And sometimes in life you go through dark times. Can I just say this to you? The Holy Spirit's with you. That's his job. He's with you. Jesus brought comfort. He strengthened his disciples while he was with them. And the Holy Spirit does that for us today. And here in this chapter, he tells the disciples that he is returning home to be with his Father in heaven. But they were not to worry. 
because he was sending them another comforter. And that is exactly what happened. And when he went home, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, came to live in us. And we knew that when we looked at this Pentecost and Pentecost Sunday. And verse 17, we read these words of Jesus. But you know him. Why do you know him? Because he lives with you. And will be in you. Yeah, no reason. You probably read that verse 20 million times. But see, we just, as I said, just take your time sometimes. And Harry's probably told you that as well. And other preachers, just take your time and slow down when you're reading God's word. But you know him, for he lives with you. And he will be with you. And in fact, Jesus is saying, I'm not only with you, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. So it's a twofold thing, isn't it? Jesus goes with us, and the Holy Spirit is in us. Two for the price of one. But we'd be three if we count the Heavenly Father. So when Jesus went back to heaven, he actually came back into their hearts and lives by the Holy Spirit. Remember, well, for those of us who were here, remember I said this to you, Bethlehem is God with us. Calvary is God for us. But when we come to Pentecost and after that, it is God in us. So God never leaves us. From the very beginning till the end, he's with us until we be with him. Uh, forever I often wonder I'm sure you do as well how silent heaven must have been when Jesus left and we know that he was sent by his father and we know why he was sent nevertheless he and his angels saw Jesus and it must have been funny for the angels to see Jesus imprisoned if you like in a human body they probably couldn't grasp that the Son of God as a person. They must have wondered why he suffered. They saw him suffering. He was homeless. He was tired. He was hungry. He was threatened. He was rejected. He was hated. And you think you've got problems. And yet at the same time, they saw the same God, how their God had humbled himself and became obedient unto death as the world rejected him. But how they must have rejoiced, not at Calvary, but how they must have rejoiced when he went back home to be with his father. His work on earth was finished. His death on Calvary, because we know he came to die for us, he said it is finished. That was a cry from the cross. And that was the end of his earthly mission. Not to leave us on his own. But look what he says. I will not leave you as... Oh, I love that verse. I will never leave you. Never forsake you. Even when you're at your lowest ebb. Do you know that thing? Out of the gloom and doom there came a voice that said smell and be happy. Things could be worse. So I did smell, and I was happy, and things did get worse. But that's not as much. That's sometimes we feel that's how it is. But you and I have to remember, even when you're going through, I know some of you are going through tough times and hard times. And sometimes it's hard to keep the faith. But look what Christ went through for us. And God is still with us. Jesus went to heaven so the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, might come and dwell in us. And work in us. The Holy Spirit. One of the words we use for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. I bet it's a C or a K, I'm not very sure. Which means one's called to our side to help. So when you're in trouble, you cry out, help me. Another one is comforter. And sometimes we think comfort is taking you and holding you gently and patting your back and telling you, now, now, everything's all right. But in actual fact, he's not just the one who soothes us, but the word comforter actually means the one who strengthens us. If you split that word come and fort into two, I don't want to go through English or Greek because Harry will probably give me a thrashing at that, but the word fort is strong. That's where it comes from. 
So it's here it strengthens us. So when you're in that gloomy place, he comes alongside us. It's not just to comfort and pat us on the shoulder and give us a cuddle, because he does that now and again, but he strengthens us. But when you're what the future holds, you come and draw alongside and comfort us. So you and I are made strong, or you should be made strong, by the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Another word is counsellor or or advocate, one who pleads on our behalf. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit pleads on our behalf. You know, we get it all wrong, and the Holy Spirit pleads. Jesus pleads on our behalf as well. What a privilege that you and I know that we have an advocate, not any old advocate, but one who is from God. How big, a, how big a cruise sheet could you get? So often we're guilty of seeking help and advice, and that is good. But don't get me wrong, but sometimes we bypass the comforter. Sometimes we bypass the counselor, we, we bypass God, we bypass the advocate. And we don't ask him for wisdom and guidance and help. But you and I have to realize, as if you need to learn, the Holy Spirit carries on where Jesus left off. Now, if you lived in the times of Jesus and you had a problem and he was your next door neighbor, whose door would you chap? It's the same. You just chap the Holy Spirit. Tell him you need his help. He's known as the Spirit of Truth. Doesn't lie. And he tells us in verse, well, verse oh, 26 it is. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the, uh, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Who teaches you? No me. We, we just leave it open to God. Hopefully we get it right. Well, there's a lot to answer for. But the Spirit teaches you. Who tells you what is right and what is wrong? The Holy Spirit will tell you that, won't you? You go to do something wrong, you'll know. Ah, uh, you're right, you do. But it's not applying it as a problem. <laughs> you know? I'm going to have words with him. Nah, 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 nah. Something's right, my own way. But it's the Holy Spirit who teaches us. So one of the main functions is to bring the word of God into every situation of our life. Some people will say to you, what would God do? Or what would Jesus do? Sometimes I answer, I've not got a clue. Because sometimes Jesus never acts the way I think he should have acted. Do you know what I mean? Jesus said to Nicodemus, who was a very, very religious man, you must be born again. And he says to a woman who was taken in sin, don't, don't sin anymore. You'd think Jesus would have said to Nicodemus, you stop sinning. And you'd think he'd have said to the, the woman who had so many husbands, you need to be born again. So sometimes I don't know what Jesus would do. But his main aim is to bring the word of God to you. How many times have you been in a situation and you don't know whether it's right or wrong or whether you should say something and all of a sudden a word from God comes into your mind? Who tells you that? Holy Spirit. Do you not understand? I mean, that's how it goes. I think sometimes people make God's word dead hard. You know, it's, it's simple at times. It's just a planet. It is the big, big issue. Not only there's a Holy Spirit, there's verse 26 again, but he goes on to say, he will remind you of everything I have said to you. So basically the Holy Spirit stimulates the memory. So not only does he tell us the word, he helps us to remember the words of Jesus. This is evidenced by, by the writers of the Gospels because we know that the, the Bible was written not there and then at that time. You know, I ah, feel for these writers. June, my wife June, and an earlier date, she could do shorthand. Is that a dying thing? Pittman's, how they're called? Pittman's shorthand. She couldn't have said in, in the boss's office and just like squiggles, wasn't it? They didn't have these things. So these scribes would have to have taken God's word and written all down. How did Moses remember everything? The Holy Spirit. 
When these guys came to write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Romans, and Paul wrote all these letters, who told them? Holy Spirit. Just wasn't he made up? The Holy Spirit will let them know all these things. The Holy Spirit illuminates their minds. They brought all these events about the life and times of Jesus to their minds and their memory and so they were able to take pen to paper and give us God's word today. And so it should be when we seek the Spirit He brings to our memory many things. Not only the word of God but maybe brings things to our minds things that we have to put right You know, there's been situations when I've said I'd better go and see somebody and get this sorted. A year later, I really should go and see Harry and get it sorted. Can't be bothered. Do you know that? That's a great phrase, isn't it? Can't be bothered. That's terrible. If you've upset anybody or did wrong and the Holy Spirit brings that to your mind, can I suggest to you that you go and get it sorted? That should be right. And the Holy Spirit is good at doing that. He's good at not... I don't mean bringing up sin from 40 years ago because we've been forgiven for all that. If you've asked for forgiveness, you're forgiven. But sometimes there's still niggly wee things between people that should basically be sorted. And we know there are a lot of ruined lives because people don't get things sorted. So this may be time to seek the spirit that may, may reveal these things of the past. We have to go and make restitution as far as we are able. So I think it's part of the comforter's job to bring to our memory broken promises. There's a singer called um, Janice Ian. I don't recommend her lifestyle. But she sings a song. And in this song she says this. And all those promises that you made and left behind were filled with emptiness broken promises all those promises you never could deny that you made love a lie I've said to people before maybe I've said it but I don't know the the biggest mistake is we say to people I'll give you a ring you ever been at a wedding I'm sure you have at a funeral and you see a long lost cousin for about 19 whatever it is and you'll say I'll give you a call and you're probably like that. You have no intentions. And yet God's word says, let your yea be a yea. And sometimes the Holy Spirit might bring that to your mind. And if that's the case, get it sorted. Not only does it take your minds back, but it can reveal things that are still to happen. John 16 verse 13 says this, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he can reveal things to us. He's revealed heaven to us. But at the same time, as well as making heaven real, the Spirit certainly made heaven real with all its many mansions the thing too is if he can make heaven real he makes hell real and we live in a society in the world today where we have no concept of what hell is and you and I as Christian people we need to be aware of the reality of hell as it should make us all the more determined to speak to others about Jesus and the hope that they might give their lives to Christ and by so doing Save them an eternity of misery. There'll be many films when you see cowboy films, and I like cowboy films, when the guy will say, when will I see you next? And the guy will say, well, I'll probably see you in hell. I'm sure you know this. No, th- that thing about us, they won't see anybody. Completely dark. Nobody will see a thing. And you feel that phone the guys who wrote these thoughts and says, get your facts right. Hell's total darkness. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. Who makes Jesus real to us? Holy Spirit. Who opens your minds and hearts to the things of God? Holy Spirit. We don't give him his place. It's he makes Jesus real to us. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you can say hand on heart Jesus is Lord the Holy Spirit has directed you 
He's with you. He's in you. That's how it's meant to be. I trust that all of us have a real sense of the reality of Jesus and the reality of Calvary. Um, I'm sure I've heard these phrases, live as if Jesus died yesterday, rose today, and is coming back tomorrow. There's a lot of truth in that, that we should be living as Christ would have us live. You and I should be determined to have a deeper and deeper relationship with Christ. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit then to make Jesus real to us, to make Calvary real to us, to make heaven real to us, to make hell real, and to make eternity real. Because he's the spirit of truth, and he's the spirit of reality. So the spirit of truth, the spirit of reality, who is the comforter, opens our eyes and minds and hearts to see the truth. And many times when you come to God's word, you ask that the Holy Spirit would reveal himself. Or by the Holy Spirit, he would reveal God to you. And as we come into God's house, we often pray, not just on the name of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit would guide us. And that's chapter 8, and don't want to look at that because we've looked at it so many times. It reminds us that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he brings us power. Power to see the truth, power to be able to see. It enables us to understand the mind of God and the truth of God. And you and I know the difference between truth and reality. You and I know the difference between darkness and light. So the Holy Spirit not only brings us power to see, but that verse 8 it gives us the power to witness. I love Psalm 107 says this, I won't quote it all, but it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say, No, I love a song, I heard the voice of Jesus, and also sometimes I quote that, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and you go, what? What he said to you? You know? I heard the voice of Jesus. You know, when's the, when's the last time God spoke to you? What did he say to you? And what have you done with what he told you? So that's why I ask the question, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and we've got the same thing here in Psalm 107. Let the redeemed of the Lord say. Let the redeemed of the Lord say he's great. Let the redeemed of the Lord say he's with me every day. Let the redeemed of the Lord say I'm going to witness to my neighbor. So whatever these things, but that's what it is. We've got the power to speak in the name of Jesus. Power to speak about God. Power to speak of the things of God. And power to speak about God, but going beyond all that, and I'm, you know, I, I, I think during this pandemic, there's more people praying to God than ever, and there's more triplets going up, and uh, there's more people praying. Will you pray for? Will you pray for? It's, I mean, phone calls are growing. You know, June kind of runs a thing with maybe, maybe a dozen women in the church. She'll do a prayer every morning, and they all join in. So see for maybe half an hour in the morning, there's a new women's prayer meeting going on. And they don't even meet. But you and I have the power to speak with God. And to God. Prayer times. Not only a witnessing people. But a praying people. That was, that was how the church was in the very early days. Not just were they witnessing. But they were praying. And you and I need the comforter. To help us to pray. This is what Romans 8 says. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And then he goes on to say. You don't know what we ought to pray for. I'm sure you've been sitting in prayer meetings and think. Oh, is it my turn? I wonder what I should say. And sometimes the Spirit just gives you something to say. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So even if you're the worst English speaker in the world, I'm that man. You can still pray the name of God because the Spirit's there leading and guiding. He teaches us. Um, I, I suppose today there's a desperate need for Christian faith to be vocal. I think there'll come a day where it would be. So I asked myself the question, when did I 
last say a word for Jesus? When did we last bear a word of, of witness? So not only speaking for and of God, but the same power to speak with God and to God. Let me just move on this if I can. And that's, uh, I'm just talking about triplet prayers, that's three guys that will pray and we'll, we'll explain that in a minute. It is often said that the prayer meeting is the most important meeting of the week. And even though some folk during this last year can't meet in a building, we know that prayer meetings are still going on via phone or via Zoom and via so many other things. I've heard it said, that I was trying to find the guy who said it, I think it might be Billy Sunday, but I might be wrong. On Sunday, the preacher talks to the people about God. But in the prayer meeting, we gather to talk to God about the people. Because more often at a prayer meeting, you pray on behalf of others. So we come to Sunday, basically, to talk to the people about God. And you gather together a prayer to pray for one another. And sometimes we have prayer meetings in here as well, which is good. Because we pray for folk at the end. I know we all pray at home, and quite rightly so. But there is a belief, a special blessing in getting together to pray. And once the doors are open, try and not neglect that. Someone has suggested that on the day of Pentecost, remember all the people were together in one room. What they're suggesting is, if they had been in different rooms, revival may not necessarily have taken place. But it's when they were together. I've never thought of that before. When they were together. So many churches, the Baptist Union years ago, had the triplets. I know there's still people continuing that. There's three folk all the time. Some don't say, will you pray for No phone the second person. Second, and, and you, you know the setup. The first prayer triplet, as far as I can make out, is this one here. With Moses in the middle. And Aaron, or Aaron, depending on where you come from. And her. Moses went up to the mountaintop to pray because Joshua was down fighting a battle. And Moses said, I'll pray for you. And here's another lesson. If you know people who go through a battle in life and you tell them you'll pray for them, make sure you do. Don't ever say to somebody, I'll pray for you, and you forget all about it. Because the Holy Spirit will bring that person to your mind. So Moses was up to the mountaintop to pray and he took two others with him. Always good to have somebody. If if Aaron and Hur had not gone up the mountain <laughs> to be with Moses they would never have been able to hold up Moses' arms and Joshua would never have won the battle. That's the importance of praying together. Now maybe I'm taking that too far. Aaron Hogg had never been there to hold them up, and I'm sure the Israelites still go and be scooting glass region that are doing. But we know the story. When Moses became tired, when he's praying and his arms fell at his side, Aaron and Hur raised his arms up again. And when Moses' arms went up, Joshua was running. When his arms came down, Joshua began to lose the battle. Read that story. And the victory did not depend upon the number in the valley, because there was thousands. It depended on the three on the hilltop. And there's been many things done because the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, has brought people together and brought to their hearts and minds things to pray for. So it's not by my might nor by my power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So it's the Comforter who helps you to pray, not the crowds or the numbers. I'm always achieved by Gideon. Gideon had initially an army of 32,000 to fight an army of 135,000. But God said it was too many. Those whose hearts were not in it, or just newly married, or whatever it is, and those who couldn't be bothered, he sent them home. Do you want to fight? No, no, really. Well, I'll let the road. That's basically it. And Gideon was left with 300 people. 
and you went 300 against 135,000, give us a break. You know, 300 against 135 is less than 1%. I've got an arithmetic level. It's probably only on a half. <laughs> but it's less. Can you see what God can do with 1%? Can you imagine what God can do with 100% of us? All of us. And God can take your prayers. The Holy Spirit can give you things to say. And God can change things. Don't, don't ever underestimate the power in prayer. And they had God and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter who strengthens us and helps us to pray, and in that case, to fight. We're in a battle. And made the counselor with us. How does he help us? Well, you and I need to be filled. And that again is a whole different sermon. You receive the comforter just by asking. As those who ask who receive. Jesus says if any man thirsts. Let him come to me and drink. What an abundance. That we have in Christ. The power that we have in Christ. The power that we have. When the Holy Spirit is living within us. The song. All who are thirsty. All who are weak. Come to the fountain, dip your heart in the streams of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come as deep cries out to deep. You need to be filled to overflowing. Not just a thirsting, but also a hungering. And I'm not going to time to get into that because time's away. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. If you're seeking the very presence of God, if you're seeking to be filled by the Spirit, you go and ask Him. Ask Him. If you don't ask, you don't get. So you and I need to empty ourselves and be fully. And let me just finish with the last one. I see Elijah. I don't know how you got a likeness on, but I see Elijah. The, con- the contest on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal was to ascertain who was God. That's all, that's all that is about. Well, let me tell you, it proved that God was God and that Baal was no God at all. And it proved that it only is one God and he's with us. Elijah's victory came just to remind you and then we'll be finished. Elijah built an altar. Then he killed an animal and he cut it up. Next, he began to put the pieces one by one on the altar for the fire to come down and sacrifice. He put on the first piece and what happened? He put the second piece on the altar. What happened? Nothing. He put on the third piece and nothing. It is only when he put the last piece on. He took the last bit that was left and that went on the altar and then the fire fell. Do you get that? Everything. God doesn't want a quarter, a half, three quarters. He wants a full shebang. He needs a hundred percent. And sometimes we feel in a Christian mix because we haven't given ourselves unreservedly to him. In Bretton Brown and Charlie Ellis' updated version of Just As I Am Without One Play, the chorus goes like this, Jesus take all of me. I run to you. I run to you. I lay everything at your feet. Let my life be yours. Our last piece, everything we have, has to be on the altar so that Christ can work the comforter comes now he reminds us he teaches us he teaches us new things give him space in your life allow him room to move and to lead and to guide and direct to me your prayer life <laughs> be the best ever for his name's sake I read of a businessman who was trying to sell one of his factories 
and a man came to see it, and as the businessman was shown the intended buyer round, he told him of all the uses that the factory has done it, they've done it for this and it's been used for that, and the buyer turned to the businessman and said this, it's not the building I want, it's the site. The site. Every one of us who belongs to Jesus is the site that the Holy Spirit wants. <laughs> the Holy Spirit wants all of you to come and indwell. So be prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to do so in your life so that you and I will be the people that we should be and ought to be. For his name's sake, Amen. Can I just pray just now?